Okay, we'll we'll start. So this is our third lecture on probability and uncertainty. We're going to talk about independence, marginal independence, and conditional independence, <clears throat> because they're crucial in order to get to where we want to be, which is a computational feasible theory of using probability, one that uh, we can do in a reasonable amount of time using the Bayes net. And independence is absolutely central to that idea. So this is, this is crucial. Because uh, in theory, everything in the universe could be connected to everything else, could influence everything else. And in fact, according to physics, it does. But for our purposes, we say it doesn't. Most things don't affect other things when they change. And we want to capture that connection between things that when something changes, something else changes. We want to capture that causal relationship. So are there any questions before we start? So assignment four was posted today. You've all done assignment three, almost all of you. Um, so assignment four has a long lead time. It has two and a half weeks. Don't use that lead time. <laughs> Start now. Okay, it's quite long, but uh, you need to uh, do what you can as soon as you can based on what we've done in lectures. And for example, the marginal and conditional independence for today will be enough to, to do some of the first questions. And um, I've also posted exercise 10. That's on the topic of today's lecture, marginal and conditional independence. And there's a whole example in there about credit card evaluation, trusting the user of a credit card, using probabilities. And there you'll also get to use the new app, the uh, Belief and Decision app in AI space, which you will also need for assignment four. So I suggest that you do exercise 10 before you do assignment four. So how many of you are actually doing the exercises? I mean, how much are you actually using those? Do you find them useful? Are we wasting our time in developing them and putting them up? Hold your hands up. Who's actually used any exercise? Just to be honest, I'm not marking this. Yeah, OK, but three quarters of you. So OK. Do you find them useful? Or are they too simple, too useful? Maybe I should withhold the answers a while. To make sure you try the exercise without sneaking a peek with the answer. Any suggestions about the exercises now or later, whenever? I'd you know, we'd like feedback, yeah. The ones I did for the midterm were pretty simple. Yeah. But again, okay. the midterm was simple too. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was simple. I will give you, um, speaking of that, I'll give you a practice final. Probably the final I used the uh, last time I taught this course, which was a year or so ago. Uh, so I'll give you that uh, so you can work up your answers. And I could give you the answers. I may not. I mean, it's sort of up to you. But again, I think it's more motivating somehow to work it out. And if you don't have the temptation of cheating and looking at the answers, then you actually get more out of the exercise of doing it. So anyway, that, I'll post that or give it out soon and connect. OK, good. So again, we'll do a quick recap. Um, we talked about conditioning and inference by uh, enumeration. And we talked about Bayes' rule and the cha chain rule with probabilities. So we'll quickly go over those again. And if you didn't understand them last time, maybe you will this time. If you don't, ask. Yeah. So the basic idea of conditioning, which is fundamental to the use of probability in AI, is that the agent is constantly updating her beliefs as new things happen in the world. You revise your notion of what's out there, OK? Because probabilities are subjective. They're not objective. We've been through that, right? So the fundamental notion of conditioning is that you're integrating two sources of knowledge. You have the prior knowledge, which incorporates all of your background knowledge. Whatever it is at this current state of time, you do a cut there and say, everything I know is now incorporated into the prior probability distribution which so far we've represented using the joint probability distribution. Everything you know about the world is represented in one gigantic table. Okay, Assume that for now. It's obviously not practical, but 
In theory, that's how it is. We'll discover more compact ways of representing it. But every conceivable variable you're interested in and how it co-varies with every other conceivable variable you're interested in is represented in the JPD. You sort of freeze it there. And then whenever you discover a new piece of information, like you look out the window or someone tells you something or whatever, you use a thermometer, uh, you have new evidence. It won't be certain evidence, but it will shift your beliefs. Uh, so that new evidence has to be combined with the background evidence. And that gives you what we call the posterior. You start with the prior probability. You get the evidence. You get the posterior probability distribution. And we typically write that using this vertical bar notation. The probability of the hypothesis, given the evidence, where E here can be any logical sentence. You know, like it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I looked outside, and the moon is out, and so on and so forth. Any statement that you can write in, in a reasonable logic could be part of E there. Typically, what it'll do is tell you the values of some variables that you're interested in, but not others. Okay. And so we looked at this example of the weather and the temperature. You've got a prior. Here it's a prior on the joint distribution of weather and temperature. And we've got the marginal distribution of temperature. Okay. Well, we don't appear to have the marginal distribution of temperature. So how could we get it? Right? You can marginalize out any variable in a joint probability distribution, or any set of variables. You just sum out over those conditions. So if I'm interested in this case, it said I have the marginal distribution of temperature, but I don't actually see it on the slide, so I'd have to produce it, right? So if I know, so in other words, for, the, for each value of the temperature, and I need to know the probability of the temperature, the prior probability, given no other information, if I don't know the weather, in other words, what is the probability of the temperature? And I've just got three temperature ranges. What do we call them? Hot, mild, and cold. So this is the marginal distribution of T prior distribution T. OK? So how do I get that from that JPD? I'm summing out the weather, but I'm leaving in the temperature, right? So I can look this table here and say I'm only interested, if I'm interested in the hot temperature, I look at all rows in the table that have hot in them. There are two of them, this one and this one. I'm not interested in the weather, so I'll sum out the weather. I will add these two conditions together because their measures add up because they're exclusive events. It can't be sunny and cloudy. So if it's hot, it's either sunny or cloudy. And so I will get this probability or measure here and this one here. So I'll get 0.1. I'm summing out the weather, so I get 0 0.1 plus 0 0.5. 0 0.05, 0 0.15. And I have to do that for each value of the temperature. So for mild temperatures, I find all rows with mild in them, these two. And I don't care what the weather is. And so I add 0 0.2 and 0.35. And then finally, I could get the cold by just adding up these two numbers. That would give me 0 0.7. That should be 0 0.3, I guess. So it better be, I look at the two rows with cold temperatures, sunny or cloudy, I get 0.1 plus 0.2. I already knew that was the answer, because this has to add up to 1.0. So that's how you marginalize out a variable. You're summing out over all the, the conditions of all the other variables. Okay. So that's the prior. If I don't know anything else, I'm willing to bet that 15% of the time it's going to be hot, 55% of the time it's mild, and 
30% of the time it's cold. That's my personal guess as to what the weather's going to be on any random day in Vancouver. Okay? But what if I then look outside and I see that it's sunny? I've got new evidence. This is E. Weather equals sunny. Okay? So now these, these worlds are ruled out. It's not possible to be sunny and cloudy. So these measures have to go to zero. I keep these measures in the same proportion, but I have to bump them up so they sum up to one. That's all that's going on here, right? I'm renormalizing those guys, right? So I'm setting these, these measures to zero. And so now this is the conditional, the probability distribution of the temperature given that the weather is sunny, given this new evidence, right? So what is it? We know it's 0.1 over here, but it's divided by the sum of these, so I can make them out all out to one. That's the normalizing factor. That's all that's going on there, right? The other way of saying that, the other way of seeing it is that this is the probability the temperature is what it is there, and weather is sunny, divided by the probability weather is sunny. Probability weather is sunny is adding up these three rows which is this number here. That's why that number is 0.4 there. Okay? So if you work that out, that's a 0.25, 0.5, and 0.25. If we compare that to our prior on the temperature, which was 0 0.15, 0 0.55, and 0.3, we see we're now shifted because sunny and temperature are correlated roughly in Vancouver, but they're not perfectly correlated. You know, it's not guaranteed to be hot if it's sunny. We do get the odd winter day that's sunny. So we've shifted our probability distribution towards hot. It's gone from 0.15 to 0.25 just based on this single piece of evidence. Okay? So this is a very simple example of, of combining evidence. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. So then we talked about conditional probability. And this, if you like, is the definition. The conditional probability of H given E is the joint probability of H and E divided by the prior of E. Okay? So H here, the hypothesis is that the temperature is hot, and the evidence is that the weather is sunny. That's the joint probability of hot and sunny divided by the probability of weather is sunny. So this is just a way of doing what we did here in symbolic form so that you can see we're using the conditional probability formula to compute these conditional probabilities. You just take the joint, which is whatever it was over here. That's the joint probability of these two events divided by the prior on the evidence, which is the weather being sunny. Okay, so this formula helps explain what we did here. And so now you can do anything you want. This JPD captures all our knowledge at a certain point of time. We can now incorporate any kind of evidence that will shift our beliefs about that knowledge. And we know how to, how to incorporate it, right? So the general problem, formally, is we've got this prior joint probability on set, some set, large set of variables, perhaps. We've got specific values of E for the evidence variables, E, which is some subset of those. And we want to compute the posterior joint distribution of the query variables, the ones we're interested in, which, again, might be a small subset of X, what we're, all, all we're interested in. Okay? And this is the algorithm. First condition to get the distribution probably of X given E, and then marginalize out the variables you're not interested in, leaving the query variables given E. Okay? So we know how to do that. We have an algorithm. It's exponential, but at least it works. Terminates always, etc. It's correct. Good. But it's not practical. Very memory heavy. And slow. So that leads us to consider Bayes' rule. And Bayes' rule you can almost think of just as an application of uh, the rule of conditional probability, right? Because um, Probability of E and H is the probability of E times the probability of H given E. It's also equal to the probability of H times the probability of E given H. Right? So that's just using the definition of these conditionals. 
right? So this is always how I remember Bayes' rule. Just, I just write down, I and mean, this is true for any probability theory, that the probability of a joint event is the probability of one times the probability of the other given that you know the first one. So you can think of doing an experiment. I'm either doing E first and then H, or I'm doing H first and then E. Either way, it doesn't matter, right? Because they're, they're commutative, right? So this is equal to the probability of H and E. By definition, logic, right? They commute. So you, can all, you should remember that. That's just sort of common sense. Probability of a joint pair of events is the probability of one times the conditional probability of the other given the first one. Or probability of the first one times the probability of the second one given the first, because I just swapped the, swapped the order of H and E, right? And so typically what we're interested in then now is in the probability of H given E is, we're going to write it this way around, this is Bayes' rule, and we write it that way because this, this way of thinking about things is causal. It's often forward in time. Right? The hypothesis is the internal state of the system that causes some evidence. Right? Some symptom, you know, you have got some disease, that would might be the hypothesis. It causes some symptoms. And we have good causal theories of how that works, but typically when you're doing diagnosis, you want to go the other way around, right? You're given the evidence and you want to reason backwards into the state of the system, read into the state of the system. So you're given knowledge in this form, but you want it in this form. And this is just a simple way to, to invert it. Often we call this the likelihood. This is called the likelihood. If you read the book, and I suggest that you should read the book, it didn't cost you anything, you might as well read it. And it's got a whole section, much more words than I'm giving you here. Uh, on Bayes' rule, okay, which I think would help too. So it's a little elaborate to call it a theorem. It's Bayes' rule is more, more appropriate to its status, but it's incredibly important. And here's another example where you, the alarm goes off. You want to figure out what are the odds of a fire. Well, I know that when there's a fire, the alarm always goes off. So I know these numbers. I know how often fires occur, and I know how often false alarms occur. Often you don't need to compute the denominator, often we just use ratios of the numerator, because this, no matter uh, you know, which, uh, which event we're looking at, whether it's fire or false alarm or whatever, the denominator is the same. This is always the same, so we're often just comparing the numerators. And you can sum up all the numerators, and again, you want to make the probability of this some of the probabilities of, of these, given this, has to be equal 1. Again, read the book on that point. And the other uh, theorem, if you like, that we need, it's really just based on the definition of conditional probability, as we gave it above, is that you can always expand a joint probability into a product of conditionals. Okay, so if, I have, if I'm interested in four variables, I can always write that. Again, you think of it as doing a series of experiments. I first decide what's the likelihood of A, but, but once I've done that, I know A. So I have to say, well, now what's the likelihood of B given A? And now what's the likelihood of C given A and B? And what's the likelihood of D given A, B, and C? And you could put those in any order, right? You could, you could have four factorial ways of writing down this joint probability distribution based on whichever one you put first, A, B, C, or D, followed by whichever of the other three, and so on. Right? And they're all correct. Some of them might be more useful than others, but they're all correct. Okay, so these are two basic facts of probability theory according to the way we're looking at it, and they will allow us to go into Bayes' rule and Bayes' nets.
But first we have to look at this idea of independence, which is what's going to give us a big win in terms of efficiency. And the idea is that most things in the world don't affect most other things. So that's called independence. We don't actually use the term marginal independence in the book, and, and sometimes people just say independence when they mean marginal independence. Okay? So some variables are independent, and the basic idea is sort of one of information theory. If you're interested in a variable A, how much would you pay to know the value of B? Right? If you're only interested in the value of A. If you're not willing to pay anything, I suspect they're completely uncorrelated, they're independent, etc. Right? Got nothing to do with each other. Um, but if you know it's the temperature and and, this, and uh, the weather, there's a very good correlation. And if you're betting a lot of money on what the weather is, you pay quite a bit to get some bits about what the temperature is, right? So that's another way of thinking about it. So, but in terms of independence, obvious examples are you know. If, the variable is the weather, sunny or cloudy, and tossing a dice. Give you a number one to six, right? So here's a JPD of that, which you'd write down based on your beliefs, say. And we're in, what we're interested in is the probability of the weather versus the probability that the weather, given I tell you what the dice shows. And I suspect you would believe that they are the same, and in fact, you'd be right. So what's the probability that the weather is cloudy? Have you got your cards, Andy? Wake up, time to wake up. Cloudy. So when I ask you this, what am I doing? I'm marginalizing out the dice throw. I don't care what the dice throw is. I give them the joint here, and I say, just tell me what, what are the odds it's cloudy today? Right? Given that that's the JPD, I'm marginalizing out the result. So I look for every cloudy event in the joint probability distribution and add up all the numbers. And that gives me 0.6. Right? That should, you know, once I did that, did that example, that should just fall right out. I'm marginalizing out the result. So I just add up all the cases where the weather is what I'm interested in, and I get 6 times 0 0.1, 0 0.6. Okay? So that's that. But what's this? Probably the weather given that r is equal to 6. How do we compute that? So first of all, here's how we computed the weather's cloudy. Let's say you're marginalizing out the result. So this fancy notation just says you're summing over all r's in the domain of r, where r has this value little r. It's just summing all these, these uh, probabilities here to give you 0.6, right? So what is probability the weather is cloudy given that R is 6? Remember how to compute the conditionals? How do you do that? Well, I know I'm in one of two worlds, right? If R is 6, rules out every world in which R is not 6. So all these other worlds are immediately set to 0, right? And I've got two situations there where R is 6. There's a sunny and a cloudy, right? And so I would have 0.1, sorry, 0 0.006 and 0.1, right? And I'm interested in the cloudy one. So which would you think of those four? I sort of led you to the answer, I hope. It's looking yellow to me. So how do I get that? There's two rows there. Cloudy with R equals 6 and sunny with R equals 6. The rest I can just set all those numbers to 0, ruling out those worlds, writing lines through them. And so I've got these two probabilities left, but they don't add up to 1. So I just add up those two numbers. And I get 0.166, and I divide each of them by that number. And I was interested in the cloudy one. That's this one down here. So that gives me this answer here, right? And this just spells out what I just said, OK? The probability that 
weather is cloudy and R is 6, is the probability of the weather and R is equal to 6 divided by the probability R equals 6. Probability, the, the numerator I get from the table, it's 0.1. The, the denominator I get by marginalizing out what's left, right? 0.1. Um, marginalizing out the weather. That'll give me 0.1 plus 0.066. So it's equal to the ratio of those two, which turns out to be 0.6. Amazing. Look at that. They're both the same number. How about that? Seems like an awfully long way around to get to the obvious that the weather is not affected by rolling dice. But you should be able to take the long way around to get to such an obvious answer. Okay, so this sort of affirms that you'd be wasting money if you paid anything to, to find out the result of the dice throw in order to predict the weather. And that's all this says, I think, here. Here's the, the prior probability of the weather, and here's the posterior probability of the weather given that r is equal to 6, or 3, or 2, or 1, or whatever it is, it makes no difference. They're exactly the same, tables. Okay? So that's, and then we just formalize that on this slide, just saying, well, this is the, now we'll define marginal independence. Sometimes that's just called independence. Random variable x is marginally independent of random variable y if for all values xi in the domain of x and yj in the domain of y and yk in the domain of y, two different values, the following equation holds. Probability of x equals xi given y equals yi, y, x equals xi given y equals yk is equal to the probability of x equals xi. In other words, the posterior is equal to the prior if you condition on the evidence of a, an independent variable, it tells you nothing. Okay? And that's all this says. It says what I just said. And that has to be true for all values of y. Maybe some values tell you nothing, but others tell you something, then it's not independent. Okay? It has to be true for all values. Whether it's marginally independent of the result of a dice throw. Okay, suppose we uh, toss two coins. C1 and C2 are the two costs of a fair coin or two costs of two different coins. Are they marginally independent? Well, your intuition says yes, but you'd have to sort of write down the JPD and prove that the posterior for one coin is the same as its prior. The posterior for one coin given the value of the other coin is the same as its prior. Okay? To prove it analytically. What do you think? Oh. The answer is obviously yes, right? That's a no-brainer. Because if you work out the marginal distribution of C1 before the toss of C2 and the posterior after, they'll all be 0.5. Makes no difference what's, what the value is. So are weather and temperature marginally independent? Well, I hope you, by now you understand the answer is no, because we proved it right at the beginning of the class, right? No, we saw before that knowing the weather changes our belief about the temperature. So the probability of hot prior was 0.15, and the probability of hot given cloudy is 0.5 divided by 0.6, it's 0.083, based on this JPD here. Right? So, for the hockey fans. So, suppose we have these two interesting events we're interested in. Are the Canucks going to win the Stanley Cup? How much would you bet on that? Not too much. Uh, and some numerical random variable, like how much money did they make last year? How did, much did the team make? Okay. Are those two intuitively independent? Well, if you know something about the economics of hockey, you realize you know, the revenue for a team will affect how much they can afford to pay their players, and they may have to trade someone off to get in under a revenue cap or under budget, et cetera, et cetera. So what would your guess be? I've actually worked that out. Maybe no. Right. Thank you. Not yes, but no. 
However, without the revenue, they couldn't afford to keep their best players. So let's just figure out what we can do with marginal independence, right? So this is where the big win comes in. If you know the product rule, the probability of F1 and F2 is equal to the probability of F2 given F1 times the probability of F1. But if it makes no difference what F1 is, right? If these are marginally independent, then this is just the probability of F2, right? So in other words, something you probably started out learning in a basic probability course, if you have two independent events, the probability, the joint probability is the product of the probabilities. Okay? We got to it by a rather roundabout route. So we know that, but if they're marginally independent, this is equal to that. So we have this statement here, this is absolutely key, of course, that if you have two independent events, their joint probability is the product of their individual marginal probabilities. And in general, of course, if you have x1, x2 up to xn events, then their JPD is the product of their marginals. So let's do some numbers. If Suppose these events are all, so we just write this as a continued product. This is just product of these individual terms from i equals 1 to n. Suppose these x's are all Boolean. How many entries does the uh, JPD have for the joint probability distribution of it? Right, so you remember my heuristic for answering these questions? The answer is always D to the N. <laughs> Everything else being equal. <laughs> In this case, D is 2. The domain for Booleans is 2. So there are 2 to the N entries. Of course, you can see that. You're just counting in binary in, in the X1, X, Xn's, right? And each one has to have a separate probability. It's actually, that's not, actually the correct answer is not on this. You really only, there are only 2 to the N minus 1. Subtract 1 because they have to all add up to 1, right? So there's one entry for each possible world, but if you had the marginal distributions, how many entries are there in all the marginal distributions combined? Here my default rule fails. It's not 2 to the end. So marginal distribution means I've got a distribution for x1. How many values does x1 have? It has two values, right? So you have two numbers in there. They happen to add up to one, but there are two numbers there. I have another marginal distribution for x2. It has two numbers in it and so on. There are n of them. What's n times 2? Two? 2n. Two Thank you. <laughs> that was hard. So there's a huge exponential win if you have n independent events. You only need 2n numbers to store and compute over, etc., etc., compared to 2 to the n. So it scales linearly if the events are all independent. That, of course, will hardly ever happen, but it shows us what the ideal is, right? So let's go back to the Canucks. They're not, these two random variables are not marginally independent because if I tell you their revenue from last season, that'll give you a hint as to whether they're likely to win the Stanley Cup. Because it'll tell you they're able to keep you know, the, the Sedines or whatever, right? So they are conditionally independent. If I tell you what the lineup for this season is, who are the guys they've signed for this year, that cuts off the knowledge of the revenue from last year. Okay? So once you know who's playing, then learning their revenue from last year won't change your belief in their chances. And it turns out vice versa. Right? So that's what we call conditional independence. If sometimes I can tell you the value of a third variable, and if you know that third variable, telling you the other variable doesn't make any difference. Okay? Because that, the, the extra variable I gave you is, is the one that has all the information. Okay, so here's this notion of conditional independence. And marginal independence is just a special case of conditional independence. 
A random variable x is conditionally independent of random variable y given random variable z. So you're conditioning on z if for all x in its domain and y in its domain and z in its domain, the following equation holds. In other words, I'm giving you z. In all three cases, I'm giving you the value of z, which is the current lineup in the Canucks example. Then it doesn't help to know uh, what their revenue was last season if I'm interested in whether or not they're going to win the cup. Winning the cup just depends on the current lineup in the simple theory of the Canucks. So intuitively, x and y are conditionally independent given z. If they are, then learning y equals y does not change your belief in x when we already know you're conditioning on this third variable z and telling you the second value y. And that has to again be true for all values of y it could take and all values of z it could take. So don't get tripped up by that. You have to make sure it's true for all values of, of y and z. Here's another example. This is from the book, which you've already looked at because of the museum alarm example. We wrote this out in data log. So here, suppose I tell you I'm interested in three things. Right? The, the condition of this light, power in this wire, and the status of this switch, S2, is it up or down? Okay, and power is coming in here from outside. Everything's relative to ground. So there's a hot wire here. And the question is, if I am interested in, the, in whether or not this light is lit, it's conditionally independent from the position of switch S2, given that there is power in wire 0. In other words, if I tell you wire 0 is hot, okay, there's power there. You know everything you need to know about that light because the switch is further back in the causality change. And of course, if there's power there, then this switch has to be up, and, has, and this switch has to be up too in order to get power from outside. But I don't care about that. Once I've told you there's power in that wire, it's irrelevant. You wouldn't pay any money to know anything about what's further back in the causality chain. Does that make sense? So we say condition light L1 is lit is conditionally independent from the position of so two, given whether there's power in wire zero here. Okay. Learning once you know this power wire zero is true, values for any other variable will not change our beliefs about that. Okay, that's conditional independence. They're not marginally independent. I mean, these two values, the switch position and the light, you know, in some, for some values of the switch position, it will help to know the switch position. Of course it does. If the switch position has to be up if, the, if this one's up and so on in order to get power in that. But once I tell you power has got this far, you don't care how it got there. That's the basic intuition. Here's one that might hit close to home. So consider a student in a random course, like 322. Um, you've got exam grades and assignment grades. If I tell you a student's assignment grade, we'd hope that the assignment grade and the exam grade are correlated, that the higher the assignment grade, the higher the exam grade. So it does tell you something. Do well on one, you'll typically do well on the other, unless something strange is going on. But there's a common variable, right? Remember this phrase, correlation doesn't imply causation? That's what we're talking about here. There's a common causation here. Whether or not you understand the material is what's causing you to get a good assignment grade and causing you to get an exam grade. Right? So if I tell you this, then it doesn't, that will be enough to predict the exam grade. It doesn't help to predict the assignment grade. These aren't directly related. Okay? They're only related through this common cause. Right? And there's, you know, all of science is concerned with this kind of causal structure. Is there a causal structure like this, or does the assignment grade cause the exam grade? You know, does smoking cause cancer, or is there some genetic thing that causes you both to smoke and get cancer? Right? In which case, there's correlation there between smoking and cancer, but no causation. And it's very, very tricky to control for all those variables to figure out where is causation and where is correlation. But I think you can understand that in this case, this. This is a reasonable explanation of what's going on. 
Okay? So that what we're seeing there is that these are conditionally independent, but of course they're not marginally independent, these two variables, just as in the Canucks case, right? You can go the other way. You can have a common symptom, a common effect. Suppose I have someone smoking near my alarm sensor and I have a fire which could trigger the alarm. There are two ways the alarm could be triggered, okay? These are independent events. There's no causal connection between them. And think of this as cause. Eventually these will be Bayes nets. But think of this as temporal. So the more I go down here, the further along I am in time. And fire causes alarms. Smoking causes alarms. Smoking at the sensor does. But neither of these cause each other. They're completely independent. They're uncorrelated events. Right? So these are marginally independent. But they're not conditionally independent, and we can see that, right? So it says here they're marginally independent. If I tell you this is true, it doesn't, still doesn't tell you whether or not there's a fire. It gives you no information about that. Okay, so, so suppose the alarm goes off. This is true. So you're given that evidence. There's some c common effect, okay? And you learn that someone was smoking at the sensor. Someone triggered the alarm there, your belief in the fire would go down, right? These together cause that. Because I've already got a cause for that, I don't need another cause. This is called explaining away, okay? We'll see this in, in quantitative detail later. But when you learn that one cause is true, your belief in the other cause decreases. So these are marginally independent, but not conditionally independent. So it can go both ways, okay? So all four possibilities are logically possible, okay? Two variables can be both marginally and conditionally independent. These, uh, whether or not they win the cup and whether or not the, the light is lit. Neither marginally nor conditionally independent, temperature and cloudiness, given the wind. These are not, we know these are not conditionally independent. If I tell you the wind, then that will change your belief in how these are related to each other. Conditionally but not marginally independent, exam grades and assignment grades. If they're given, if you're given understood material, then they're conditionally independent, but they're not marginally independent because they're correlated, right? Or you can have marginally but not conditionally independent, the one we just did. So now we're going to exploit conditional independence, okay? Once we discover we do have conditional independence, we know how to find it. From the JPD, you can work out if two variables are conditionally independent given a third one, right? Well, this is how you do it. You just compute. Is this true? Is it true that the, the conditional for x given y and z is the same as the conditional for x given z? You can compute all those things and you can see if it's true. Or you can use your intuition and say, yeah, it's obviously true. So if c is conditionally independent of a given b, then we can rewrite probability of C given A and B is just the probability of B. You can drop A. C is conditionally independent of A given B, so I don't need to know the value of A. It gives me no new information, so just drop it. It has to be equal to that, right? And the beauty is that here we had three variables, so we had like D to the cubed entries in its table for this guy. Now we've got D squared entries, right? Suppose we have A, B, C, and D, and D is conditionally independent of A given C, and conditionally independent of B given C, then you can drop even more. You can re rewrite probably D given A, B, C as a probability of D given B and C because of this, conditionally independent of A, and now we can drop the B because it's in conditionally independent of A, B given C. You have to keep the C because that's what gives you the conditional independence. You can't drop C. That's what separates A and B and says they're independent. But only if you know C. They may not be if you don't know C. So this is where the wind comes in. We use the chain rule. You know, as I said, you can always rewrite any joint of N events as the product of conditionals. You think of it as a series of experiments. I do experiment on variable one. I use its prior. And then the prior for the next one, given the first one prior for the third one, given the first two, and so on, right? 
We know to always do that. So the probability of A, B, C, D is the probability of A times the B given A, B, C given A, B, and for D given A, B, C. So then, of course, if D is conditionally independent of A and B given C, say we can rewrite this one as this one. So this is giving us compactness. The chain rule lets us represent the JPD as a product of conditionals. Conditional independence allows, them to, allows us to write them compactly. So we're done for today. We're going to exploit this in what we call Bayes nets. And in the limit, of course, if everything were independent of everything else, these would just be the product of A, B, C, D. But you have to put in, you have to condition on anything that will give you that conditional independence. Okay, so these are your learning goals for today. You can use and define marginal independence, conditional independence, your assignments available. Do exercise 10, get started on assignment 4 right now. And we're done. Have a good weekend.